Good morning, beautiful family. I must say, I love spending Sunday mornings with you. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Father God, how we honor you. And as we do so, be glorified. For it is you who arms us with strength. It is you who fills us. It is you who provides. And so, Lord, as you call us, as you call us to walk, to run, to change, and to rise, it is all for your namesake, all for your glory. So let every heart be fertile soil, the good soil that does both your word and your work. Father, renew us. Renew us for every new thing that you are doing. And do what only you can do. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. So be it. Trust. Trust. It can be fragile or powerful. It can be life-shattering or life-giving. It can be betrayed or it can be relied upon. Trust. It can be an end or it can be a beginning. It can be abused or it can be cherished. It can be an act or it can be an action. It can be given or it can be taken away. Trust. Today's message is titled, Trusted with the Trials and the Triumphs. Trusted with the Trials and triumphs. Please open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 45. Trust. Most of us think about trust in a very linear way. In other words, most of the times we think about trust as it applies to our access, meaning we look at trust as something we give to someone. We rarely think about the trust that is given to us, the trust that is granted to us, that is bestowed to us, the trust that has been endowed upon us. And what you are trusted with says something about you. And how long says even more. Because it means that you maintained it. It means that you did right by it. You see, trust is not a come and go emotion. It is not solely for good times, nor is it solely for bad times. Trust is not seasonal. It is not conditional. It is not a follower of crowds. It is not when it is convenient. It is not self-seeking, nor is it opportunistic. The truth is, trust is not a lot of things. But one thing that trust can never be is unwavering, unwavering. Our level of trustworthiness determines what gets entrusted to us. What can we be trusted with? Trust is in the coming and the going. Trust is in the good and the bad times. Trust is in every season. Trust is not transactional. In fact, trust is inconvenient. It is selfless, and most importantly, it is steadfast. And so today, the kind of trust that I'm talking about is not the in-the-moment kind of trust. Because you see, there are people that do things because they get something. And so we confuse their doing in a certain area as a building of trust, and that's when we mistake a tryst for a trust. Woo! Tryst for trust. You see, one is a transactional union. And sometimes transactional unions last a long time, but there's no trust. It is not a substantial relationship. You see, they look to do something with you or because they look to get something from you. That's a tryst. Trust is a lifetime union. And usually those that have trysts or transactional relationships are quite envious of those that have a trusting relationship. 
Again, trust is a lifetime union because it looks to do things with you because it looks, it seeks to do things for you. Trust is very difficult to explain in one sitting. And it is difficult to articulate in its fullness because of the dynamics of trust. But here's a brief difference between someone that can be trusted and someone that cannot. I have found that the heart of a person you can trust is that they are driven, we are all driven by something, is that they are driven by their love for you and not by how they can benefit from you. That is one of the dividing lines or better said, one of the many dividing lines between those you can trust and those you cannot. One seeks to benefit from you and the other seeks to benefit you. You see, trust is knowing that someone will do their best for your best. Trust is knowing that someone will do their very best for your best. And trust is an important factor in our relationships. You see, any solid relationship always has solid trust. And again, trust is very important in our relationships, but it is most important in our relationship with God. What can God trust you with? What can God trust you with? Today, I'm going to talk predominantly about trust as it relates to God. Now, these principles apply to relational uh, issues also because here's the great thing. If we can get our trust right with God, then we are probably going to heal and create a lot of healthy, trusting, close relationships as well because, again, any substantial relationship is built on solid trust. The other thing that I need to be clear on is that I'm not talking about trusting God. I'm not talking about trusting God. Because a lot of times it's not so much a question about what we can trust God with, it's a question about what can God trust us with. And so here's the question. Are we just looking to get something from God or are we looking to be trusted by him? Some people want the fruit, but not the hardships that come with being entrusted with sowing the seed and growing the fruit. You see, to be trusted by God with trials and triumphs is rather complimentary. It is rather complimentary, and that's because God is trusting you to resist the dangers of both. He is trusting you to withstand the dangers of both the trials and the triumphs. And yes, there are dangers. There are dangers with both trials and triumphs now. They each carry different kind of dangers, but nonetheless, each of those dangers can result in some form of destruction. However, the person that answered the question I asked with the latter will be willing to face those dangers solely because God matters more to you. In other words, what you do for God matters more to you than what you get from him. You see, trust is about consistency. Trust is built on your pattern. Trust is built on where do you always ultimately land? Where can I trust that you will always land? that eventually you will land where you need to land. You see, where we consistently land is what is honest about us. That is what is true. And sometimes the only honest thing about some people is their deception. I'm gonna say that one again. Sometimes the only honest thing about some people is their deception. He or she was honest in their deception. And so can we be trusted that wherever we land, wherever we land, it will always be for good? Not what you struggled with, not what you initially had to battle, but where you landed. 
Not what you cried about, but where you landed. Not what crossed your mind. The truth is, when you're in the thick of things and things are going crazy, a lot of crazy things cross your mind. Not that, but where did you land? Not what a desperate moment tried to overcome you with, but where did you land? Can I believe that no matter what comes at you, I can trust what will come out of you? Whew. Can I believe that no matter what gets thrown at you, I can trust what you're going to put out? I can trust her to with to withstand her struggles. I can trust him to withstand the anger. I can trust her to withstand the brokenness, him the failures, her the injustice, him the ignorance, her the betrayal, people's division, people's gossip, division, opposition. I can trust him or her with the challenges, the dangers, and the fights of the trials and the triumphs. You see, a lot of us don't look at challenges as an opportunity or a moment to be trusted. But it most certainly is. Challenges are moments to be trusted. Can we be trusted with not trying to make something feel right that isn't right? Like revenge. In comes Joseph. The story of Joseph is one of my favorites. I well up or cry almost every time I read certain parts. Joseph was a young man who was called, a young man that was favored by his father, yet hated by his own brothers, by his flesh and blood. His trial started at a young age, but he knew, he knew he was called. You see, God had given him a promise through dreams. However, it didn't start as a dream. It actually began and proved to be a long nightmare before he ever got to the dream. Think about it. God just gave him a promise, yet the first thing he experienced was the very opposite. Instead, he saw problem after problem after problem, pain after pain after pain, no sign of promise. And it went on for many years, many years. Hmm. Can you withstand the nightmare because you believe the promise of the dream? Can you withstand the nightmare in order to get to the dream? You see, Joseph was going to be tested, so very tested. And those tests came via trust. Joseph was trusted with betrayal, all kinds, family, friends, associates, you name it, he was betrayed. Trusted with abandonment, rejection, deflection, gaslighting, falsely accused, being lied about, character assassination, injustice, being wrongly imprisoned, years taken from his life for something he did not do. Metaphorically speaking, they stripped that man in so many ways and laid him bare. And yet, he never, never broke from good. He did not break from good. When we look at Joseph's life, it's important that we ask ourselves, where did he always land? Where did he always land? No matter what came at him, we could trust what would come out of Joseph. And boy, was he tested. But where did he land? I want you to hold that thought. I'll get back to Joseph in a bit. What I just talked about were the trials that Joseph experienced. But how one responds in trials is usually a good indicator of how they might, I want to highlight might, how they might respond in triumph. Because triumphs bring their own set of challenges. You see, some, some people seem to be changed 
by trials. We hear this all the time. I'm never going to do that again. I'm going to start doing this. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be committed to that. But don't rush to assumption because you must wait till the blessings come. <laughs> because some people revert when the blessings come. They forget. And some people get worse, nasty, ungrateful. Their heads get so big that their hearts shrink. That's why I always say, if you want to see a person's heart, a person's true heart, give them power. There's a lot of ways to give them power. Give them power. You may have to take it back, but give them power. See what comes out, good or bad, and then believe it, and then believe it. First, Corinth, First Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14 says, now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. <laughs> Each one's work will be clear, because there are different kinds of works, of what sort it is, all sorts. And it is the day, the day that will declare it. Did you catch that? The day, the day, in other words, after the nighttime. Woo, that's a whole other message. After all the darkness, the light, the day, when the day comes, that will declare what was there. You see, you can only see if a person has light in the darkness. You can only see if a person has light in the darkness. What stood strong? What prevailed? What was unchanged? What was the fight about? What was the fight for? Who did you fight? What did you fight to keep? What did you fight to remove? What was the fight? For You see, we are all fighting for something. The question is, what? And it is important. It is important to be clear on that we don't test God. That's his place. He tests us. And there are some trials that will be turned into tests so that God can flip them into triumphs. You see, you might be tested by fire in order to be trusted with the sacred. Oh, Job understood that. In Job chapter 23, verses 9 through 11, Job said, When he, God, works on the left hand and I cannot behold him, when he, God, turns to the right hand and I cannot see him, but he, God, knows the way that I take, when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot has held fast to his steps, and I have kept his way and not turned aside. In other words, what Job is saying is when God is working and I can't feel him, or when God is working and I can't see him, he can still trust the way that I will go. Because when he tests me, I'll come forth as gold because I will keep his way and never turn aside. You see, Job understands that the test is when you cannot see God. The test is when you cannot feel God, yet you still keep his way. Let's take a look at the definition of test. Test, a procedure intended to establish the quality the performance or reliability of something, especially before it's taken into widespread use. Woo! Test means to establish the quality, reliability, before it's taken into widespread use. Listen, before you can be used, you must be tested. Before you can be used, you must be tested because it is the ordeal that proves your ordination. It is the ordeal that proves your ordination. That is what proves your appointment because you can withstand the ordeal. 
Trust ain't trust without a test. And trust in whatever area does not become trust until it is tested. And true trust must be tested in two parts, the bad and the good. Listen, you don't want grave diggers or gold diggers. They're both ratchet. What you want are those that dig for God, those that seek God. Because you can only give your beautiful and your ugly to whom you trust. That is why the beautiful and the ugly is given to whom is trusted. And so here's a question. Have you been battle tested so that you can be battle trusted? Have you been battle tested so that you can be battle trusted? You see, Moses took risks. King David took risks. Queen Esther took risks. Nehemiah took risks. Ruth took risks. Joshua took risks. Rahab took risks. Daniel took risks. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego took risks. Peter and James took risks. The woman with the issue of blood took risks. The friends of the paralyzed man took risks. Mary Magdalene took risks. Mary, the mother of Jesus, took risks. Paul took risks. Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God took risks because no one, no one that God has ever used was without risk because there is no rise without risk. There is no rise without risk. God can only trust the rise to you if you have proved trustworthy with the risk. Can you be trusted with the risks? And what have you been willing to risk? Just a little bit, little bit, or everything. Have you been willing to risk heartbreak by giving someone a second chance? Have you been willing to risk being called wrong simply because you're doing what is right? Have you been willing to risk your ego in order to right a wrong? Have you been willing to risk getting nothing in return for giving your everything? Have you been willing to risk being labeled because you refuse to label? Have you been willing to risk being hurt for the sake of healing? Listen, sometimes we all got to hurt in order to heal. That is a fact. We've got to hurt in order to heal. That hurt will show us what needs to be healed. And have you been willing to risk losing for the sake of the greater win? That's another thing. We all have to understand that we all have got to lose a little bit so that all of us can win. We must lose the things that need to be lost so that we can all win. What have you been willing to risk? You see, trust is tied to risk. Trust is the established quality of someone's reliability. Woo! They have the quality of reliability. That's a quality. Which means you can trust that person or rely on them with bearing the risks. The risk tolerance is within range because you know where they're always going to land. You know that they're going to bear it. That's what trust is. Listen. You only prove good when you stay good after you've encountered the bad. And that's because fire tests what kind of metal it is. What kind of metal it is. God is looking for consistency. What do we consistently do? Are you consistently faithful? Faithful in the little, faithful in the big. Faithful in the dark, faithful in the light. Faithful in the front, faithful in the back. Faithful in the spotlight, faithful behind the curtain. Are you faithful when no one is watching? Do you correct or do you corrode? What consistently comes out? Because listen, listen family, when you have withstood the tests, 
when you have withstood the risks, when you have stood faithful to our faithful God, to the God that is always there, when you have proved to stay with the God that stays, get ready. Get thee ready, family. This is intimate for me. One of my favorite names for God is Yahweh. Yahweh. Yahweh means the God that is always there. Even when I can't see him, he's always there. Even when I can't feel him, he's always there. Even when the crazy has reached crazy levels, he's still there. Even when the pain is unbearable, he's still there. And when you stay with the God that is always there, he will prove that he was indeed always there. But the question is, are you always there? Are you? Can God trust you? See, I go back to the fact that it's not about us testing God. God doesn't need to prove his goodness. Never. It is about what type of metal do we prove to be when we get tested? What type of metal? Aluminum foil, tin, scrap metal, or titanium, silver, gold, platinum. Because that's what determines what we get trusted with. Does that type of metal have the ability to bear it? Can we trust that metal to bear the task? Can we trust that it won't go bad, that it won't turn, that it won't rust, that it won't fold, that that metal won't crumble underneath the pressure? Can that metal bear both the rain and the sun? You see, there are challenges and blessings in both the trials and the triumphs. And you must be willing you must be willing to stay the course that God has put you on. While everything around you changes, while some people jump off course, this one we saw was a deceiver. This one a betrayer. This one couldn't handle it, jump ship. This one just lies and lies. And listen to me, that's all good. Let the fire test the metal, what sort it is. You stay on your course because the truth is they are not going where you're going. And so as you keep your course, God will replace that one with five, that one with 10, that one with 100, that one with 1,000. I need you to lean in. Do you remember when Judas came with the guards to betray Jesus? the nerve. He betrays him with a kiss. And we all remember Jesus' words to Judas. You betray me with a kiss, Judas? But in the book of Matthew, there's something else Jesus said to him. Jesus looked at Judas and said, go. Go and do what you came here to do. In other words, you turned, Judas. You betrayed, Judas. And you may have chosen to be a part of the devastation, Judas. So go. Go and do what you came here to do, but don't you get it twisted, Judas. Because I'm still going to do what I came here to do. And sometimes you need to tell your devil, listen, devil, your twist, your turn, your crazy, your lies, and your change is not going to twist, turn, or change me. You must be willing, listen, you must be willing to never sell out your God, although you may have been sold out. And a lot of us, you know what, there's some selling out of God. And you must be willing to never sell out God, although you may have been sold out. Back to Joseph, you wanna talk about being sold out? There's so much to extract from the story of Joseph, but the truth is that's a series. 
And so today I wanted to focus on the end, a specific part. In Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 8a, then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, make everyone go out from me. It's probably his staff and maybe some friends. Bottom line is, this is a private moment. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and he wept aloud. And the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, please, come near to me. You who threw me away, it's okay. You can still come near to me. So they came near. And then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now, it was not you who sent me here, but God. Woo! That is so powerful because at the end of the day, after all that is said and done, after all the revelations and the unveilings of who is who and what and what, what is what, sometimes you just say, what? After all of life's betrayals and life's beatings, after all the losses and the gains, and the gains, Joseph was clear on three things. But in that clarity, we need to be clear there was still pain. Clarity doesn't omit pain. I mean, look. He wept so loud that everyone could hear him. These are the brothers that began his nightmare. These are the people that set in motion 13 torturous years of his life. But Joseph chose the purpose in spite of the pain. In spite of the pain, in spite of the crying, he was still very clear, clear on three things. Number one, you sold me. I want you to understand that I understand what you did. And we are not going to sweep it under the rug. We are not going to pretend it didn't happen. You sold me. Number two, but God sent me. I need you to understand what he did. You sold me, but he sent me. Number three, and God sent me to bring his great deliverance, and not just for me, but for everyone, including you, the ones that sold me. You see, this is Joseph's moment. And again, Joseph is being trusted with a moment. Joseph's in the triumph now. He's in the triumph. He's in the triumph now. He can easily seek revenge. And most would say he had every right. These are the people that left him for dead. And he had that power. He can kill them, exile them, or imprison them. But he doesn't. He does not. You want to know what he actually does? He blesses them. That is so hard. He blesses them. I have a saying. The best payback you can give someone is to give them what they did not give you. You see, he understood the purpose of his power, and he did right by it. Joseph did right by it. What good is power if you do not do right by it? What good is power if it's not good? 
You know, Joseph used the word posterity, which reveals that he had a clear understanding of his call. You see, posterity means succeeding, succession, future generations, collectively the whole. It also means all descendants of one. Because we are all descendants of one. Hmm. In other words, Joseph was telling them, God trusted me for all of us. God trusted me with all of that for all of us. Because God didn't just send me for me. Like God doesn't just send you for you. God sends us for us. Listen carefully. With Joseph's 13 years of a famined life, he was able to, deliver, to, de to deliver the known world from famine for seven years and then turn around and ensure fruitfulness for many years thereafter. And like Joseph, you, like Joseph, you, metaphorically speaking, you are going to feed the hungry from where you once were hungry. You are going to provide from the very place where you once lacked. From that place that you were broken, barren, in pain, that's what you're going to feed others with. From there. You see, there's a great deliverance that God has trusted us with. That is why it is a great compliment, great compliment, when God trusts you with the battles. It's important to be battle trusted. And so if you are in pain, Join the club. We have all experienced pain. It's the one universal language. And if you've been in a nightmare, I believe we have all collectively been in a nightmare. But there are also individual nightmares. And so I'm talking about all kinds of nightmares. God gave me a word for you, family. The dream is coming. The dream is coming. And if you need to weep like Joseph, if you need to weep, it's okay. Weep. But weep knowing this. God is saying, I trust you with the pain of purpose. I trust you with the hard work. I trust you with the hard choices. I trust you with the heartaches. I trust you with the sacrifices. I trust you with the betrayals and the losses. I trust you with the adversity and the bullies and the fight and the battle. I trust you for the war because I trust you with the win. God is also saying, I trust you with the treasures. That's why I trust you with what's coming, the promise. You know, the triumph, I trust you with the victory. I trust you with the blessings. I trust you with the overflow, with the respect, honor, and the glory. I trust you with the gains, with the expansions, with the transformations. I trust you with my treasure. And so when you need to weep, weep and then wipe your eyes. Stand up. Look up from where thy help comes from and keep on keeping on. I'm about to give you a word, a few words, but this one line, I want you to carry it with you. Carry it with you. And when you are in the thick of it, it's coming from everywhere. Nothing makes sense. This is what God says to you. I choose you because I trust you. I choose you because I trust you. That was what God said to me. And it stopped my tears and solidified a lot of things for me. And it always solidifies things for me. And now I share it with you, family. Those words are for you. I choose you because I trust you. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, Joseph said, But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about it as it is this day, to save many 
people alive. Listen carefully. In order for us to bring about as it is this day, in other words, how it will be, the promise, because there will be an as it is this day. You will be face to face with your promises. But we first must understand what we have been trusted with. And you will say to your devil, you may have meant this, or you may have meant that, but God meant it for good, and therefore it is as God meant it to be. So it may take 13 years, devil. It may take 13 months, 13 days, or 13 hours, but we will wait for our as it is this day. We will wait for our promise. We will fight for our promise. We will rise for our promise. We will keep on keeping on for our promise. Because at the end of the day, we shall all echo the words of Joseph. You sold me, but God sent me. You sold me, but God sent me. You tried me, but God trusted me. You may have sold us, but God sent us. You sold us to break, but God sent us for a breakthrough. You sold us to the pit, but God sent us to the palace. You sold us to depression, but God sent us to rejoice. You sold us out, but God sent us up. You sold us to change, but God sent us to rise. You may have sold us, devil, but God sent us for a great deliverance. Our sellout has turned into our great send out. You see, that will be God's great confirmation of his authority. God will be undeniable, undeniable. Listen, the devil's set up to make you fail was God's set up for your success. And I speak this over each and every one of you. And so lift your arms, lift your, your hands, receive it, proclaim it, declare it. You see, you have several promises. And you're going to say these words throughout your lifetime. Because again, you don't just have one promise, you have several. And every single time, your promise is opposed by the devil. You shall say to your devil, you shall say to your battle, you shall say to your betrayer or to whoever or whatever tries to throw you in the pit, here are your words. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good as it is this day because you shall be face to face with your promises and the world shall see the power of but God in our lives. So say it, you sold me, but God sent me. And here I am, as it is this day, here it is, God's promise. Here is the promise of God. Amen? So be it unto you.